O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudeva. O all pervading personality of Godhead. O all pervading personality of Godhead. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Our from our respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth. And the primeval cause of all causes. And the primeval cause of, of all the causes. Creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. Of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji. The original living being. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations. Of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Of water seen on the fire of land seen in water. Only because of him do the material universes. Only because of him do the material universe. Temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature. Temporarily manifested by the reaction of the three modes of nature. Appear factual although they are unreal. Appear factual although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode. Which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. Which is forever free from the illusory representations. I meditate upon him for he is the absolute truth. I meditate upon him for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Projita Kaitravutra. Dharma Projita Kaitavutra. Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam. Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam. Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu. Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu. Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam. Shivadam Tapa Trayon Mulanam. Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Kite. Shumad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimva Parer Ishwaraha Kimva Parer Ishwaraha Sadyo Hidi Avarudya Tetra Sadyo Ruddi Avarudya Tetra Kriti Bihe Shushu Shubhistakshana Kriti Bihe Shushu Shubhistakyanat Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth Which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. The highest truth is the reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. It is beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity. It's sufficient in itself for God realization. It's sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? What is the need of the other scripture? As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. As soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam. By this culture of knowledge. By this culture of knowledge. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. The Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nigama kalpataror galitam phalam. Nigama kalpataror galitam phalam. Sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam. Sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam. Pibata bhagavatam rasamalayam. Pibata bhagavatam rasamalayam. Muhur aho raska bhuvi bhavaka. Muhur aho rasika bhuvi bhavaka. Oh, expert and thoughtful men, relish shimad bhagavatam. Oh, expert and thoughtful men, relish shimad bhagavatam. The mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. The mature fruit through the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. It has emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadev Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice is already relishable for all. Although its nectarian juice is already relishable for including all. Including liberated souls. Including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swak. 
Sakata Krishna, Shravantam Sakata Krishna, Punya Shravana Kirtana, Punya Shravana Kirtana, Vidyantak Stohi Abhadrani, Vidyantak Stohi Abhadrani, Vidu Noti Surit Satam, Vidu Noti Surit Satam, to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures, to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures, or to hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita, or to hear from him directly from Bhagavad Gita, is it self righteous activity? It's a righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna. And for one who hears about Krishna. Lord Krishna who is dwelling within everyone's heart. Lord Krishna is dwelling within everyone's heart. Acts as a best wishing friend. Acts as his best wishing and friend. And purifies the devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. And purifies the devotee who is constantly engaged in hearing of Nasta him. Presu Badresu. Nasta Presu Badresu. Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya. Bhagavati Uttama Sloke. Bhagavati Uttama Sloke. Bhakti Bhavati Nastiki. Bhakti Bhavati Nastiki. In this way, a devotee develops naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. And this way a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam. As he hears more about Krishna from Bhagavatam. And from the devotees. And from the devotees. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. He becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Tadarajas tamo bhava. Kamaloba dayaschaye. Kamaloba dayaschaye. Chaitai taranavidam. Chaitai taranavidam. Sthitvam sattve prasidati. Sthitvam sattve prasidati. By development of devotional service. By development of devotional service. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. One becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus material loss and avarice are diminished. And thus material loss and avarice are diminished. Evam prasanna manasu. Evam prasanna manasu. Bhagavat bhakti yogataha. Bhagavat bhakti yogata. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Bhagavat tattva vijnanam. Mukta sangasya jayate. Mukta sangasya jayate. When these impurities <coughs> are wiped away. When all these impurities are wiped away. The candidate remains <coughs> steady in his position of pure goodness. The candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness. Becomes enlivened by devotional service. Becomes enlivened by devotional service. And understands the science of God perfectly. And understands the science of God perfectly. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Vidyate hridaya grantis. Chidyante sarvasam saya. Chidyante sarvasam saya. Chidyante chasya karmani. Chidyante sacha karmani. Chidyante evat manishwari. Druta evat manishwari. Das bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. Das the bhakti yoga severs the hard knot of material affection. And enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samaritan. And enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsha samagraha. Understanding of the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Understanding the supreme absolute truth, personality of Godhead. Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 16. We're going to go again over text 26 to 30. And I'll just, you know, I'll just read the translation. In Him, meaning Krishna, reside. Truthfulness, cleanliness, intolerance of another's happiness, unhappiness, intolerance of another's unhappiness, and the power to control anger, self-satisfaction, and straightforwardness, steadiness of mind, control of the, of the sense organs, responsibility, and equality. So we'll stop on that equality. I want to talk about that today. So... Prabhupada writes in the purport, by equality, point number 10. The Lord is equally kind to everyone, as the sun is equal in distributing its rays over everyone. Yet, there are many who are unable to take the advantage of the sun's rays. Similarly, the Lord says that surrendering unto him is the guarantee for all protection from him. But unfortunate persons are unable to accept this proposition, and therefore they suffer from all material miseries. So even though the Lord is equally well-wishing to everyone, the unfortunate living being, due to bad association only, is unable to accept his instructions in toto. In toto means completely. And for this, the Lord is never to be blamed. He is called the well-wisher for the devotees only. 
He appears to be partial to his devotees, but factually the matter rests on the living being to accept or reject equal treatment by the Lord. And this is an extremely important point and sorely understood or not really well understood by others, especially the materialists who say, if God is a merciful God, then why is there suffering in this world? And uh, why is it that uh, he seems to be partial to the uh, devotees and not, because he says, yadi yadi hi dharma sya glani bhavati bharata abhidrasna adasya dharma sya and he says uh, that uh, when there's a decline in religious activity and, and concomitant rise of irreligion at that time, he, he uh, appears and paritranaya sadhanam vinasaya chadishkutam dharma samstar panartaya sambhavam yadamaya. He comes in order to destroy the demons, liberate the devotees, and reestablish the principles of religion. So it sounds like he only likes devotees and he doesn't like the demons. However, uh, if we carefully look at scriptural evidence, uh, first of all, Krishna says, Yes, not tart karma nun yatra lokomam karma bandhanai. Tadaratam karma konteya mukta sangha sujayate. So he says, Work done as a sacrifice for Vishnu has to be performed, otherwise, work causes bondage in this material world. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for his satisfaction, and in that way you will always remain free from bondage. So the Lord is saying, look, I'm offering this to everyone. Just engage in acts of sacrifice for Lord Vishnu or for myself. This is the great art of doing work, and offer the results to the Lord without any uh, attachment, uh, material attachment. And uh, if you do this, you'll always be remain free from bondage. So that's his best advice. However, uh, people don't listen. And therefore, the Lord says also, Name partasti karta vyam trisulo kesukinchina. He says, O son of Prita, there's no work prescribed for me within all the three planetary systems, nor am I in want of anything, nor have I a need to obtain anything, and yet I am engaged in prescribed duties. Why is that? For if I ever failed to engage in carefully performing prescribed duties, O Partha, certainly all men would follow my path. And then what would happen? If I did not perform prescribed duties, all the worlds would be put to ruination. I would be the cause of creating unwanted population and I would thereby destroy the peace of all living beings. So we see that the Lord has a real, um, let's say, love for, his, for all living entities. Therefore, although he doesn't have to, he gives an example of how to follow the rules and regulations uh, prescribed for living entities in the material world to become free of the entanglement. So as an ideal husband, an ideal king in Dwarka, he follows all the rules, he gives an example of it. Therefore it says, Tasmat asakta satatam karyam karma samachara, asakto hi acharan karma param apno tipurushaha, Therefore, without being attached to the fruits of activities, one should act as a matter of duty. For by working without attachment, one attains the supreme. So this is the point, acting as a matter of duty. Like for example, there's such a thing in India as love marriage. And people get married because they're attracted to each other and they say it's love. Actually, it's lust, but they say it's love. And then many times, these love marriages are broken up by divorce. 
Whereas before, there was hardly any divorce in India. In fact, among the Gujaratis in uh, South Africa, there was no divorce for, for a long, long time. And even in India, there is very seldom was there any divorce. Nowadays, there's a lot of divorces in India. It's all because of this love marriage. It means it's actually lust marriage. However, marriage should be undertaken as a matter of duty. And, and that means that one should not be married just because of physical attraction, but one should be married as a duty to serve Krishna jointly or mutually as, as best friends and best well-wishers. Husband and wife work together to please the Lord. So that's, there are many examples of that, like uh, uh, Vasudeva and Devaki, and Nanda Maharaj and Yasodhamai. So there are couples in the spiritual world, right? Not only in Vaikuntha, but also in Goloka, you see. There are, there are many, many couples in uh, uh, Vaikuntha, uh, ideal couples. And there's no, it's not, their, their, their relationship is not based on sense gratification. It's based on their mutual desire to please Krishna. See? So, uh, this idea of acting out of duty. So Prabhupada says, the Supreme is the personality of Godhead for the devotees and liberation for the impersonalists. A person, therefore, acting for Krishna or in Krishna consciousness under proper guidance and without attachment to the result of the work is certainly making progress toward the supreme goal of life. Arjuna is told that he should fight in the battle of Kurukshetra for the interest of Krishna because Krishna wanted him to fight. To be a good man or a nonviolent man is a personal attachment. But to act on behalf of the supreme is to act without attachment for the result. That is the perfect action of the highest degree recommended by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Vedic rituals, like prescribed sacrifices, are performed for purification of impious activities that were performed in the field of sense gratification. But action in Krishna consciousness is transcendental to the reactions of good or evil work. A Krishna conscious person has no attachment for the result, but acts on behalf of Krishna alone. He engages in all kinds of activities, but is completely non-attached. Ah, very interesting. And how can you be completely non-attached? By acting out of duty. Not acting because of lusty desires. So, and also it says that many kings in the past, like Janaka, attained perfection solely by performance of prescribed duties. Therefore, just for the sake of educating the people in general, you should perform your work. So, this acting out of duty in marriage, in business, in uh, any field, in devotional service, is extremely important. That means that whether you like someone or you don't like someone, whether you like the work or you don't like the work, you do it out of a sense of duty, as long as you're offering the result to Krishna. So, uh, therefore, yadyana charati shastas tatat evitaro kuru sayat pramanam kuru te lokastat anavartate. Whatever action a great man performs, common men follow, and whatever standards such a great person sets become the standards for society. So Krishna is the greatest, and he gave that example of a unattached uh, grihasta in Dwarka with a lot of kids and a lot of wives, but he acted perfectly, waking up early every morning and meditating on himself because he's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We, we shouldn't do that, but he did that because who else is he going to meditate on? He's not going to meditate on anyone else. And, uh, and therefore, uh, he would do his morning program and then he would uh, take some prasadam, go to, go to work in the, uh, the uh, uh, great uh, uh, palace and do the business of the state as an ideal king. And then 
like that. He, he gave an example of a perfect grihasta. So then, however, this question of equality is very important, and we're going to go into that more in depth now. So the question of equality is explained uh, beginning in uh, uh, 414, uh, where, where Krishna says, Namam karma ni limpanti, name karma phale spriha, itimam yo bijananti karma virna sabadyate. There's no work that affects me, nor do I aspire for the fruits of action. One who understands this truth about me also does not become entangled in the fruit of reaction of work. So, Krishna also is giving us an example of how to work without attachment. And how is that? Well, you offer the result to Krishna. So, uh, the Prabhupada explains in the purport, as there are constitutional laws in the material world stating that the king could do no wrong, or that the king is not subject to the state laws. Similarly, Lord, the Lord, <coughs> although he is the creator of the material world, is not affected by the activities of the material world. He creates and remains aloof from the creation, whereas the living entities are entangled in the fruit of results of material activities because of their propensity for lording it over material resources. The proprietor of an establishment is not responsible for the rights and wrong activities of the workers, but the workers are themselves responsible. The living entities are engaged in their respective activities of sense gratification, and these activities are not ordained by the Lord. For advancement of sense gratification, the living entities are engaged in the work of this world, and they aspire to heavenly happiness after death. The Lord, being full in himself, has no attachment for so-called heavenly happiness. The heavenly demigods are only his engaged servants. The proprietor never desires the low-grade happiness such as the workers may desire. He is aloof from the material actions and reactions. For example, the rains are not responsible for different types of vegetation that appear on the earth, although without such rains, there is no possibility of vegetative growth. In other words, it's the earth and the seeds, right? But without the rain, the seeds would never sprout and, and it would never grow. So basically, this is the beginning of the explanation how the Lord is equal to everyone and he's not responsible for people ignoring his instructions. The people themselves are responsible for ignoring his instructions. And they can't even say that we didn't know his instructions because his instructions are given in uh, different religions of the world uh, in different degrees, of course. Uh, but in the Bhagavad Gita, the full instruction is there. So therefore, it says, uh, the Vedic Smriti confirms this fact as follows. Nimitta matram eva so srij yanam sarga karmani pradana karani bhutva yato vai srija saktaya. In the material creations, the Lord is only the supreme cause. The immediate cause is material nature, by which the cosmic manifestation is made visible. That's a verse, that's a quote. Then Prabhupada says, the created beings are of many varieties, such as the demigods, human beings, and lower animals, and all of them are subject to the reactions of their past good or bad activities. The Lord only gives them the proper facilities for such activities and the regulations of the modes of nature, but he is never responsible for their past and present activities. In the Vedanta Sutra 2.134, it is confirmed, Vaisham ya nayarginye na sapek satvat. The Lord is never partial to any living entity. In other words, he's equal to all. Just like the sun, the sunshine is for everybody, right? And, and the sun doesn't make any, any differentiation. It's like, oh, this guy's a nonsense. I'm not going to shine on his head. No. Everyone gets the sunshine. So in the same way, the Lord gives his mercy to everyone, the possibility to everyone to become free from the cycle of birth and death. Yajnar, Tart, Karma, No, Nyatra, Loko, Mam, Karma, He says, 
just offer your service to Lord Vishnu or to, to me, because Krishna is Lord Vishnu also, and uh, you'll become free of bondage. But some people don't accept. So therefore, Krishna, if you don't accept, or if we don't accept, Krishna is never responsible for their past and present activities. The Lord is never partial to any living being. The living entity is responsible for his own acts. The Lord only gives him facilities through the agency of material nature, the external energy, meaning through maya. Anyone who is fully conversant with all the intricacies of the law of karma or fruit of activities does not become affected by the results of his activities. In other words, the person who understands this transcendental nature of the Lord is an experienced man in Krishna consciousness, and thus he is never subjected to the laws of karma. One who does not know the transcendental nature of the Lord and who thinks that the activities of the Lord are aimed at fruit of results, as are the activities of the ordinary living entities, certainly becomes entangled himself in fruit of reactions, but one who knows the Supreme Lord is a liberated soul fixed in Krishna consciousness. So, this is very interesting. This is called the uh, equality of the Lord. He's not partial. But yet, if someone becomes his devotee and serves him with love and devotion, he is partial. And it's only natural because uh, he becomes, in a sense, beholden to his devotee who is sincerely serving him. So this is explained further in fifth chapter, fifteenth verse, which says, "Nadate kashchitit kashchit papam achayva sukritam vibhu agyane navritam gyanam tena muhyanti jantava." Nor does the supreme Lord assume anyone's sinful or pious activities. Embodied beings, however, are bewildered because of the ignorance which covers their real knowledge. This bewilderment is due to bad association, developing a lusty nature, and when that lust is frustrated, one becomes angry and greedy. Then one goes to hell or lives in hell. See? And there's so many people that are angry and greedy today and in the past. But there are more today than in the past. In the past, they were the big guys like Ravana and Kamsa and uh, like that, these deep, big demons, Hiranyakashipu. Nowadays, there's millions of them, you know, and they're in families also. You might have someone like that in your family, right? And therefore, uh, Krishna explains in this verse uh, 5.15, he says, but the living entities, bewildered by ignorance, desire to be put in certain conditions of life. Thereby, his chain of action and reaction begins. A living entity is, by superior nature, full of knowledge. Nevertheless, he's prone to be influenced by ignorance due to his limited power. The Lord is omnipotent, but the living entity is not. The Lord is vibhu or omniscient, meaning uh, completely aware of everything, completely knowledgeable. But the living entity is anu, or atomic. Because he is a living soul, he has the capacity to desire by his free will. Such desire is fulfilled only by the omnipotent Lord. And so, when the living entity is bewildered in his desires, the Lord allows him to fulfill those desires but the Lord is never responsible for the actions and reactions of the particular situation which may be desired. Being in a bewildered condition, therefore, the embodied soul identifies himself with the circumstantial material body and becomes subjected to the temporary misery and happiness of life. Actually, the happiness is also a misery in material life. Right? Uh, so, the Lord is the constant companion of living entity as Paramatma, or the super soul, and therefore he can understand the desires of the individual soul, as one can smell the flavor of a flower by being near it. 
Desire is a subtle form of conditioning for the living entity. So he's talking about material desires. If you desire to serve Krishna and actually do it, that is not a material desire. But the desire to serve oneself, to engage in sense gratification, uh, and because of that, become very lax or completely aloof from devotional service. Uh, that is an illicit desire. And that's what he's talking about here. Desire is a subtle form of conditioning for the living entity. The Lord fulfills his desire as he deserves. In other words, you only get those satisfaction and desires that you deserve by your karma. Not more, not less. You can do as many, or we can do as many pujas and sacrifices that we want, but that will not change what we deserve by our previous karma. Man proposes and God disposes. The individual is not therefore omnipotent in fulfilling his desires. Now even to do sense gratification, we have to have Krishna's help. We can't do it on our own because we're not controlling uh, the functioning of the body. How do we know that? Well, when you go to sleep at night, are you controlling the functioning of your body? No, you're breathing. You're not consciously aware of it. You're not consciously doing it. You're not controlling the digestion that's taking place in your body. You're not controlling anything, basically, <laughs> except what you desire. And if you desire sense gratification, you get it trapped out of ignorance. And if you desire to serve Krishna, that's a good desire. But unless you actually do it, you won't get the result. You'll get maybe rebirth as a human being, but you will not go back to Godhead. You have to actually engage in devotional service to, to get the result. Just desiring it is good, it's not bad, but it should lead, if you're in good association, to actually working uh, without self-aggrandizement uh, self, uh, for the pleasure of Krishna. So. However, it says here, the Lord, however, can fulfill all desires and the Lord being neutral to everyone does not interfere with the desires of the minute independent living entities. So, he didn't make us like robots. A robot can only follow what the robot manufacturer says, right? Or does, or programs. But we're not robots. We have limited free will. However, so it says the Lord does not interfere with the desires of the minute independent living entities. However, when one desires Krishna, the Lord takes special care and encourages one to desire in such a way that one can attain to him and be eternally happy. The Vedic hymns therefore declare the Lord engages the living entity in pious activities so that he may be elevated. The Lord engages him in impious activities so that he may go to hell. And then it says, the living entity is completely dependent in his distress and happiness. By the will of the Supreme, he can go to heaven or hell as a cloud is driven by the air. Therefore, the embodied soul by his immemorial desire to avoid Krishna consciousness causes his own bewilderment. Consequently, although he is constitutionally eternal, blissful and cognizant, Due to the littleness of his existence, he forgets his constitutional position of service to the Lord and is thus entrapped by nescience or ignorance. And under the spell of ignorance, the living entity claims that the Lord is responsible for his conditional existence. You see how crazy people are. The Vedanta Sutra also confirms this. The Lord neither hates nor likes anyone though he appears to. So now we're going to explain a little bit more. <laughs> this is all very interesting. Why is it that people suffer? Why is it that people are always harassed by the laws of material nature, the law of karma? So let's explain chapter 3 beginning in verse 36, which says, 
Arjuna said, O descendant of Vrishni, by what is one impelled to sinful acts, even unwillingly, as if engaged by force? And Krishna says, Kama esa krodha esa raga guna samud bhavan mahasana mahapapma vidikpat vidhi enam ihavairinam. The Supreme Personality God has said, it is lust only, Arjuna, which is born of contact with the material mode of passion and later transformed into wrath or anger and which is the all-devouring sinful enemy of this world. So this lust, the, what has happened is, earlier in, uh, it explains that love of Krishna is transformed into lust by contact with the material nature. However, once it gets transformed into lust, it's very difficult to transform it back into love. It's something like E equals MC squared. You know. Energy equals uh, mass that, pass, that uh, travels at the speed of light. Right? And, and then this, this transformation can take place. Uh, one thing's transformed, energy is transformed into mass, and the mass can go back to energy. But you have to be at the speed of light, which is 176,000 miles per hour. So, so it's not, not an easy thing. So this transformation has taken place already in all of us, where our original love for Krishna, and we all had originally love for Krishna, has been transformed into lust. Okay, so now how does it go back? That's not an easy thing. Once that happens, it's very difficult to go back. But it's possible. And uh, therefore, it explains this. Uh, where, uh, in the fourth chapter, where it says, Ajnas chas sardanasya samsayatma binasiti Nayam lokosti naparo nasukam samsayatmanaha. First of all, it says, but ignorant and faithless persons who doubt the revealed scriptures do not attain God consciousness. They fall down. For the doubting soul, there is, hap there is happiness neither in this world nor the next. But the previous verse says, a faithful man who is dedicated to transcendental knowledge and who subdues his senses is eligible to achieve such knowledge and having achieved it, he quickly attains the supreme spiritual peace. So there's this correlation between uh, becoming free through knowledge, freeing yourself from lust, anger, greed, through knowledge. Which says, as blazing... As a blazing fire turns firewood to ashes, O Arjuna, so does the fire of knowledge burn to ashes all reactions to material activities. So Prabhupada says in that purport, perfect knowledge of self and super-self and of their relationship is compared herein to fire. This fire not only burns up all reactions to impious activities, but also all reactions to pious activities, turning them to ashes. There are many sages stages of reaction. Reaction in the making, reaction fructifying, reaction already achieved, and reaction a priori. But knowledge of the condition, constitutional position of living entity burns everything to ashes. When one is in complete knowledge, all reactions, both a priori and a posteriori, are consumed. In the Vedas, Brihad Aran Yaika Upanishad 4.4.22, it is stated, one overcomes both the pious and impious reactions of work. So, a priori means something existing before the fact. And a posteriori means something existing after the fact. After the fact. So, uh, what is existing before the fact is the tendency to sin. Or the tendency to be attracted to sense gratification. And what develops by association with the modes of material nature is the strong desire for sense gratification. 
And then that leads to acting impiously, acting sinfully. And then there's a period where the sinful reaction is not manifest. And then there's a period when the sinful reaction becomes partially and then fully manifest. So these are the four stages of uh, karmic reaction. And after the full uh, maturity of the sinful reaction and the suffering, what remains that goes to the next uh, material body in life is the attraction or the tendency to be attracted to sense gratification. And then it can start all over again. The only way to stop this is, number one, not have bad association, and number two, always have good association. But what we're doing today, even our own devotees, we put our children into bad association, purposely. And therefore, some of them may survive, and many of them will not survive. Because bad association inflames the tendency to be attracted to sense gratification. And you can see we are surrounded by it all the time, everywhere, whether we're a child or we're an adult. And how to uh, overcome that? Well, this is explained even more uh, in the uh, 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, where it says, Yashastravidim utshidja vartate kamakarataha nasasadim avapnati nasukam na param gatim. He who discards scriptural injunctions and acts according to his own whims attains neither perfection nor happiness nor the supreme destination. So, what does that mean? Acting by our own whims. That's explained in the purport. As described before, the Shastra Vidhi, or the directions of the Shastra, is given to the different castes and orders of human society. Everyone is expected to follow these rules and regulations. If one does not follow them and acts whimsically according to his lust, greed, and desire, then he never will be perfect in his life. In other words, a man may theoretically know all these things, but if he does not apply them in his own life, then he is to be known as the lowest of mankind. So, it's because of lust, greed, and desire that one becomes whimsical. That is, you know what's right, but you're attracted to what's wrong, and every once in a while, or all the time, you just do the wrong thing. Although you know what's right, you see, and, but you can't control yourself. Therefore, uh, what happens to such people uh, that can't control themselves? This explained uh, in 16th chapter, 19th verse, and 20th verse, Tamaham Drisata Kuran, those who are envious and mischievous, who are the lowest among men, I perpetually cast into the ocean of material existence into various demoniac species of life. So Prabhupada says, in this verse, it is clearly indicated that the placing of a particular individual soul in a particular body is the prerogative of the supreme will. In other words, Krishna does this through his agents like Yamaraj. The demonic, demoniac person may not agree to accept the supremacy of the Lord, and it is a fact that he may act according to his own whims. But his next birth will depend upon the decision of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and not on himself. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto is stated that an individual soul, after his death, is put into the womb of a mother where he gets a particular type of body under the supervision of superior power. Therefore, in the material existence, we find so many species of life, animals, insects, men, and so, so on. <laughs> so we discussed this yesterday, right? If you become an insect, you can only go up. You can't go back down. But when you get to the human form of life, you can go up or down, right? And you can really go down if you're nonsense, complete nonsense. Or you can partially go down if you're not so much nonsense. Or you'll go down 
not so badly if you're mostly good and a little bit nonsense. But you're going to go down, right? So uh, therefore, what, what people are going to say that it's Krishna's fault. So in the next verse, Krishna says, attaining repeated birth amongst the species of demoniac life, O son of Kunti, such persons can never approach me. Gradually, they sink down to the most abominable type of existence. That means you become dogs and hogs, or even lower. So in the purport, it says, it is known that God is all merciful. But here we find that God is never merciful to the demoniac. It is clearly stated that the demoniac people, life after life, are put into the wombs of similar demons. And not achieving the mercy of the Supreme Lord, they go down and down, so that at last they achieve bodies like those of cats, dogs, and hogs. It is clearly stated, and by the way, we see there's more and more cats, dogs, and hogs, right? and crows also, and so forth. And of course, insects and bugs. And so, in the Vedas, it is clearly stated that such demons have practically no chance of receiving the mercy of God at any stage of later life. In the Vedas, also, it is stated that such persons gradually sink to become dogs and hogs. It may be then argued in this connection that God should not be advertised as all merciful if he is not merciful to such demons. In answer to this question, in the Vedanta Sutra, we find that the Supreme Lord has no hatred for anyone. The placing of the Asuras, the demons, in the lowest status of life is simply another feature of his mercy. Sometimes the Asuras are killed by the Supreme Lord, but this killing is also good for them. For in the Vedic literature, we find that anyone who is killed by the Supreme Lord becomes liberated. There are instances in history of many asuras, Ravana, Kamsa, and Anyakashipu, to whom the Lord appeared in various incarnations just to kill them. Therefore, God's mercy is shown to the asuras if they are fortunate enough to be killed by him. Wow, this is powerful stuff. Uh, so, this is an expose, what I just did, of God's equality. But yet, people... Say, oh, he can't be a merciful God. Look what he's done here. You know, these people are suffering. Those people are suffering. I'm suffering. My family members are suffering. It's all their fault. It's not Krishna's fault. He's done everything possible to give them a chance to get free. And because of their tendency to be attracted to sense gratification and then their uh, complete surrender to sense gratification, they're causing this to themselves. No one else is causing it. So, we see that dependence on Krishna is freedom. And ignorance of Krishna is dependence on Maya. And don't depend on Maya because it's not going to be nice. It's not going to be nice at all. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Are there any questions? Everyone was liberated in the Battle of Kurukshetra. 640 million people. Oh, so wait a minute. Speak in the mic. I'm sorry. S start your question again. Yes, Maharaj. So in the Lord's presence, even the demons that are killed will eventually, uh, they are also liberated. Because they're seeing the Lord. Is, is that, okay, that's, that's my question is like, you know, is it because eventually they are in association of the Lord, that's why? Yes, yes. Uh, this is explained in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, so does their consciousness at the time of death shift then? Well, it's, look, Okay, this is explained here. 
God is never merciful to the demoniac. Now, in the case of Hiranyakashipu, he failed to recognize uh, Lord Nisringadev as the Supreme Lord or Vishnu. And thus, he became Ravana in the next life with unlimited material uh, opulences. But he failed, or Ravana failed to recognize Lord Rama as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then he appeared as Sisupala with immense, uh, okay, so he had unlimited material opulence. So Sisupala appeared with immense opulence and he was envious of Lord Krishna. But he was constantly thinking of Krishna and repeated his name. And when he was killed by Sudarshan Chakra, he merged into the body of the Lord. So you see, it's progressive. And uh, he became, there was, you know, the same person was becoming a demon three times. Mm -hmm. But uh, when he was killed by the Sudarshan Chakra of the Lord, he merged into the body of the Lord. It's a type of, you know, Brahman uh, liberation. Either you merge into the light of Brahman or you merge into the body. Both are mergings. Right? So Ravana was Shiva Bhakta, but Shiva could not liberate him. Ravana was liberated by Lord Krishna in the form of Rama who killed him. So therefore the Lord is merciful in all situations. He doesn't see uh, you know, uh, that he's, he's not partial, but he gives special attention to devotees who actually engage in his devotional service. Okay. So what is your question again? Yeah, uh, the question is, uh, for such a living entity, even if they are killed by the Lord, does their consciousness, in, because in order for them to be liberated and be in the spiritual world all the time, they have their consciousness has to shift and recognize the well, power of the Lord, right? As soon as they see the Lord, their consciousness shifts. Hmm. Like, for example, Kubja. She was a hunchback woman. But when she saw the Lord, she became lusty. Right, and wanted to embrace him or, or, or uh, have you know sex with him. So the Lord, being merciful, hugged her, and when she was hugged by him, uh, she complete. Well, before that, he he uh, eliminated her hunchback, and she became a beautiful woman. But later on, when he hugged, when she wanted to have sex with him, he hugged her, and her sex desire went away, and she became purified completely. So any contact with the Lord is, pure. is purifying. Yeah, just like any contact with fire, you'll get burned. Right? So any contact with the Lord, positive or negative, is purifying. Hmm. Yeah, I think that explains. Yeah. Thank you. You can read that pastime in the Krishna book of Kubja. Hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, wait a minute, you have to come to the microphone. Sorry. Uh, when a living entity is born in a, as a worm or an insect, they'll go higher and a human being will go higher or lower. Can you please explain, Maharaj, why, how uh, the insect Somebody when so it's because the lower forms of life do not have free will. Okay. They, they have what's called instinct, but in instinct is the dictation of, of God. Oh, okay. Paramatma. Okay. So they're forced to act in certain ways. Whereas we have limited free will. And if we exercise it correctly, we can go back to God. And if we don't exercise it correctly, we stay in the cycle of birth and death. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna Maharaj. It's more in similar lines with what Mataji asked. Speak louder. Sorry. Mm, here it says first demons are there, then they f uh, further degrade to dogs and hogs. Um, so in such case, how do they get liberation, not liberation, like get knowledge of the Lord and 
how do they come out of the cycle? Um, well, there are some examples of devotees who liberated dogs and hogs, or dogs at least. And hog, you have uh, uh, the demon who was uh, Baraha uh, killed. Uh, oh, who's that? Wait a minute. Uh, no, okay. Forget that. So you you have, like, for example, Lord Shaitanya liberated a dog. The dog followed uh, uh, what was his name? Shiva. What's that? Shivananda Sena. Sena. Yeah. From uh, uh, Navadvip all the way to uh, uh, Jagannath Puri, and right before uh, Shivananda Sena arrived, he, but Shivananda Sena took care of the dog because he was following the devotees. He made sure he got into boats floating across the rivers and things like that. And but right before they arrived in Jagannapuri, the dog disappeared, and Shivananda Sena was in anxiety. He said, "What happened?" You know. But then, when they actually saw Lord Chaitanya, they saw that the dog was there, and Lord Chaitanya had thrown him. I think it was a banana peel or something like that. The dog ate it, and then he disappeared again. And later on, they found out that he went back to Godhead by the mercy of the Lord. So. And then Lord Chaitanya dancing in the uh, Jarakanda forest made tigers and deers and rabbits uh, all dancing and chanting Hare Krishna. Of course, we don't have that power, but he has that power. And then he also liberated the Saptala trees by hugging them, and they went back to Godhead. So that means that the, everything that's living has a soul, an individual soul. And all souls are coming originally from Krishna. They all have an original dis uh, relationship with Krishna. And simply by chanting Hare Krishna, whether you're in a forest alone or let's say you go up uh, Mount Sai, you can walk up. This is, this is a relatively not a very high mountain. It's close by here. You can walk all the way up to the top and you'll see uh, the Cascade Mountains. It's a very beautiful view on the top, right? And you can shout, Hare Krishna, and you'll hear an echo, Hare Krishna, come back. That's the mountain re uh, chanting back to you. <laughs> so mountains are people also. I mean, they're, they're living entities. You see? So the, the way to uh, communicate with the ants all the way up to the demigods and, and Krishna is to chant Hare Krishna out loud. And it has an effect on all living entities. Now, we might not see that, you know, that you can chant to your dog and say, Hare Krishna, you know, and you just look at it <laughs> like that, you know. But there is an effect. And you can give the dog prasadam, etc. And many people, devotees, some devotees I know, have dogs. And they've developed this relationship with the dog, giving it only prasadam not giving it meat and chanting and, and, and uh, associating in a positive way. And they, they'll swear that that dog had an auspicious death and, uh, and they're convinced that a dog, you know, is going to take either a wonderful birth as a human being or maybe go back to Godhead because they, they, they could see the dog reacting in a positive way to Krishna consciousness. So. So anyway, this chanting of Hare Krishna breaks through all the lines of demarcation between humans and animals and insects and, and so forth. And you should have that faith. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. All glories to Srila Prabhupada.